uh, in this monk school, presentations are in English, but concerning heraldry, that is a tad more complicated than it seems. You, you, the public, are linguistically a diverse group, I think. If I'm right, there are quite some uh, Flemish and Dutch uh, participants, but many with other mother tongues. And my own mother tongue is Dutch, but I live and work in, work in France. And presenting in English is fine, but I almost never um, describe heraldry in English. I've never learned to do it either in Dutch, for that matter, because I've always done it in French. How I once asked an, asked an English historian to translate for me a rather complicated description in Blazon. And his first answer was, oh, just leave it in French. English Blazon is based on French Blazon anyway. Well, that is true, but it's not the whole truth. In the coming hour, an important subject will be blazon. Blazon is the language in which heraldry, coats of arms, are described. Coats of arms are first and foremost visual things, of course. They came about in Europe in the 12th century as something useful to recognize visually who was in front of you when you were on the battlefield or elsewhere, when you saw a knight hidden behind his full armor. Bearing some kind of bearing some kind of um, recognizable object, a color or an emblem, was of course a much older tradition. It is easy to imagine how a person or a group could make their shields identifiable by painting or by sticking certain furs or metals on their shields. These you see on the screen are some modern creations, but we see on the Bayeux tapestry made in the late 11th century, how shields were provided with certain forms and colors. And it was only later in the 12th century, however, that Western European knights began in a more systematic way to bear certain forms and colors on their shields. Since everyone on the battlefield held a shield in front of him, it was obvious the spot to fix these forms and colors. We see here how arms were displayed on shields, but since quite early on also elsewhere, for example, on clothes and on horse blankets. This is not a course on the history of heraldry, so I will jump over quite a lot of details, but it is important to emphasize a few points, practical points, but also points to avoid misunderstandings about heraldry. The first point is that I want to make is that coats of arms became something very widespread in the later medieval society of the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries, and indeed beyond into modern times until today. Thus, though heraldry was born to distinguish knights, it rapidly became in the course of the 13th century something that could designate anyone, men as well as women, bore arms. Here we see two examples of women displaying arms, left and right, of their full-length portrait on their seals. But also nobles as well as commoners bore arms, and clergy as well as, peop as lay people bore arms. Even individuals as well as all kinds of communities did. Fraternities, cities, monasteries, brotherhoods, corporations, schools, etc. Here you see some examples of armed seals of a noblewoman, an abbot, a non-noble townsman, a peasant from Normandy, and of the city of Saarburg in Alsace. So this leads us to the definition of heraldry as formulated by Michel Pastoureau. Arms are colored emblems belonging to an individual, to a family, or to a collectivity, the composition of which follows the specific rules we call blazon. The second point I want to make it that is that it is a widespread belief that parted coats of arms, we say party per pale, armoirie parti, that means split in two vertically halves, are arms of a married couple. But this is not the case. 
this kind of arms, these kind of arms usually indicates a woman, a married woman, but only she. Here we see how in the 13th century, Jeanne de Chatillon is identified by the arms of her father, Jean de Chatillon, on the right, under her left hand, and of her husband, Peter of Alençon, on the left, below her right hand. But in the 15th century, Mary of Savoy, Marie de Savoie, is identified by party arms, party per pale, party per pale, that means uh, vertically parted in two halves, Savoy on the right and Visconti on the left. One could say the two were stuck together into one shield. I will come back on female arms in a moment. The third preliminary point I want to make is that arms are like a signature. When we see arms on a seal attached to a document, it works that way. When we see arms above the doorway of a building, it means you enter not in just a building, but in someone's building. But arms go further than that, further than just a signature. Arms impersonate someone. When in a meeting, the seat of an absentee is provided with his arms, or when at a funeral a coffin is draped in an armed cloth or provided with an armed shield, it means to say the person, though absent, still has a real presence here. We realize this when we observe heralds clothed in the arms of their office or other people clothed in their own arms. The herald is a representative of his lord, and he shows this very literally by bearing the arms on him. The best way to realize how someone's arms really represent someone, actually are him or her, is the fact that in describing arms, Dexter describes the left side and Sinister the right side. This may seem a whim until you realize that you are describing someone. When I look at you, I see your left hand on the right and your right hand on the left. It's just a matter of perspective. Moreover, the upper part is called chief, chef in French, meaning head, of course. And when a crown or a helmet are shown on top of this, this clearly also means to tell the viewer that the arms impersonate someone. Even the terms heart and navel, coeur et nombril, are sometimes used in describing arms. However, on the other hand, not every term refers to the human body. Thus, we see, for example, in base or the French queue, tail, that that is different. Fourth preliminary point is that a coat of arms is only what is shown within a specific, well-defined space, often in the form of a shield, but many other forms exist, round, square, oval, etc. Things that are added outside this space are often significant and even very important and interesting. Emblems, mottos, or a color of a chivalric order, and even just the colors of the mantle can help us identify a person. But these are all not included in the blazon description of the arms. Here we see the arms of a cardinal on the left, in the upper left, uh, as represented on a book binding. Therefore, these arms are topped by a cardinal's hat. On the right, I show you the arms of a nobleman who is member of the Order of the Golden Fleece. Therefore, the color surrounds the color of the Golden Fleece surrounds the coat of arms, just as if it is hanging around the neck of the person. All of this is significant, but para heraldic outside the blazoned space. Coats of arms are, by essence, something visual. Modern developments include image-based queries, purely visual searches. Indeed, as many of you will know, a Google search can now be done not only with words, but also with an image. For those of you who have never done this, just click on the lens icon 
and upload an image you have previously saved on your computer. It can help you find and identify visual things. I uploaded this image on the left, and look, among the results we indeed find some excellent answers. But you also see that the algorithm proposes some quite different arms as well. I also uploaded this picture on the left with more complicated arms. And the algorithm gave me many answers, but not a single one of the correct arms. So here it did not work. However, a click on find image source, which you see just above the image, did lead me directly to the online images of the correct manuscript. So the algorithm is better in finding an exact match than leading me to online images, uh, than leading me to find similar images. I search with this image, which we will encounter again in a minute. I thought that with this modern computer drawn image, a good result would come out. However, the result was this. Crabs, lobsters and crayfish. I had a good laugh, but it was not very helpful in identifying the arms. I searched with this image of the arms as we saw uh, that we saw already a minute ago. The algorithm selected only the shell and proposed shells. Right. OK, thanks, algorithm. I knew this was a shell, but I want to know more. But in that case, you can enlarge here the, the, the search and the algorithm searches further with the whole of the picture. I don't know why he did it in the first place with with only the shell. And then I got some excellent answers. Leading me to the correct answer to identify these arms. So definitely these algorithms are far from perfect, but image based query image based queries are possible and do deliver results. And I'm quite sure they will get better over the next years. What is interesting, but I won't go into that more further, is that more than one project of developing heraldic search databases using this kind of techniques are on the way and hopefully will lead to what we are all waiting for. One simple place or a few simple places on the Internet where we can all identify. Well, maybe not all coats of arms, but many coats of arms. But for the moment, that's for the future, and it could well be the near future. Back to blazon, the language with which we describe coats of arms, la langue du blason. As I said, arms are essentially something visual, built up of forms and colors. But from the very start onwards, arms have been described as well. For these descriptions, a language was conceived called blazon, blazon. In modern times, blazon has been systematized to become a logic structure. But that is something typical of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries. It is important to realize that blazon is a natural language. It has not been invented like Esperanto or like some code. It has been created naturally just like English, French or Dutch or whatever other language. Therefore, this language has its rules, but it also has its liberties and exceptions and variation. Moreover, since we are interested in, coat, in coats of arms from the past, we have to realize that things change over times. The way to depict arms is not immutable and blazon isn't immutable either. As a language, blazon leaves the user freedom. One can express the same thing in various ways, just like, as I can in English or in Dutch or in French or whatever. So please do not think that blazon is some sort of simple code. No, it is a living language with all its creativity, frivolity and liberty. Blazon is a language 
um, but of course it is a language that is only used for a very specific purpose, describe corps of arms. And what is also typical is that it depends always on another language. So we have French blazon, English blazon, German blazon, etc. I always compare blazon to sign language. Deaf people use sign languages. These have not been invented, like Esperanto has been invented by some clever guy, but they have come into existence naturally, progressively. English deaf and French deaf and German deaf do not speak the same sign language. That is just as logic or illogic as the fact that spoken English, French and German differ. All of these are natural languages and it is the same for Blazon. I cannot teach you Blazon in an hour. Moreover, like I said in the beginning, I personally, personally only rarely use English Blazon, but I hope to convince you that Blazon is not that difficult. And just like you, like you can understand any foreign language, at least a bit, once you've seen some basic principles, and once you keep a dictionary and a grammar at hand, so you can with Blazon. Many simple guides exist, printed in various languages. I don't know much, I must say, about those in English, but I must admit, sorry, but I think that in various languages there are many that are fine and well conceived. Of course, you can also think onla find online just about everything you want. I've made a list for you of a selection of these titles and links. I've put the link in the chat and you can download it. Indeed, the internet provides loads of handy websites. Wikipedia is very well structured and richly provided on the subject of heraldry, particularly in English, but also in French and I think in several other languages too. It gives you many clues on terminology as well as more general information. At the institute where I work, the IRHT, the Institut de Recherche et d'Histoire des Textes, is a very, uh, has been developed a nice website not by me, but by my colleagues before I arrived in the Institute, that is called Des Armoiries et des Livres, Les Manuscrits de Pierre Lorfebvre. It explains not only the basics of heraldry, but discusses also more specifically arms as ownership marks in medieval manuscripts. The website Heraldica is very old for a website, for a website, because it's like more than 20 years old and quite basic. But the online heraldic translator it has, and you have the link in the document I put in the chat, still works perfectly. It, this is really a very handy tool, allowing you to translate terms of blazon from and to six languages, English, French, German, Dutch, Spanish and Italian. And it is illustrated. The only thing is you don't type any letters with accents. So if you write French, you just leave out the, the accents. As mentioned in the vocabulary of English blazon, sorry, as I mentioned, the vocabulary of English blazon is largely based on French. There are, however, differences and even some problems. Arms mostly use six basic tinctures, two metals, and five and four colors. In French, one says six couleurs, deux métaux et quatre émaux. There you see that the, the word color, couleur, has a different meaning in English and in French. For or and argent, English simply uses the French word pronounced in English. The same goes for sable, sable. So you just have to remember that gold and yellow are always described as ore, silver and white are always described as argent, and black is described as sable. The English terms gules for red and az azure for blue have a slightly modified spelling as compared to French, gueule et azure. Vert, however, is a wholly different word from the French sinople. Though, of course, vert is derived from the French word for green, vert. 
So there we see that, like in all languages, differences exist and have ex historical explanations because language evolves over time. There are also furs, fourrure, the two most important of which are ermine, ermine and ver. Ermine et ver. This reminds us again of the fact that arms originally were made on, of cloths and furs fixed on a shield. Ver is a representation of squirrel furs. Now, if you want to identify a coat of arms, you have, you have found in a manuscript with the help of the grammar and dictionary-like tools I mentioned, you can describe it in blazon or even just part of it. And with this description, you can search for clues. I will now discuss some examples of this. On the Monk website, I have opened the Antiphonina, Antiphonarium from the St. Baths Abdei, the Antiphonary of the St. Baths Abbey. In the beginning of this manuscript, we find hidden in the marginal decoration on the right, two angels holding a coat of arms. These are well-known arms, but just for now, we pretend we do not know where they refer to. It is not so easy to see, so for the sake of explanatory clarity, I also show you a drawing of the same arms. In spite of what we saw earlier, it is not a crab. To blazon arms, we always describe from the background towards us. Do not forget, it is as if a shield on which things have been attached. So we first say it is blue, and then that there is a lion in silver and red, and last, that he has a golden crown, tongue, and claws. In blazon, this is azure, a lion, berry, argent, and gules, armed, langed, and crowned all. Now that the horizontal stripes are called berry, of course you just have to know. But as I said, this is the kind of thing you can look up in one of those guides just as when you are in a restaurant in an exotic country and ask for something with your tourist dictionary at hand. Otherwise, it is quite straightforward. Azure, because it's blue. Then a lion, berry, argent and gules. And then armed, langued and crowned or. In French, it is d'azur. Au lion, facé d'argent et de gueule. Armé, l'an passé, once you have blazoned your coat of arms, you can do a simple Google search with Azure, a lion, berry, argent, and gules. Sorry, I see I forgot an E in the query in the top, so that has to be Azure with an E at the end. Do use the quotation marks. But I recommend to do Google queries with significant, but not too long parts of blazon. So I have left out the claws and the tongue and the crown because there is variety in blazon where you put commas and so on. So then the Google search with the quotation marks uh, gives um, less results. So Googling. Azure, Alliant, Berry, Argent and Gules gives you a series of hits you can check. Arms in various countries and various moments in time. Browsing through these can take quite some time to see if these are serious leads or not. In doing this, as in all research, we do not have to forget what we are looking for. We are looking for arms in a manuscript, and because this manuscript has an approximate date and has probably other indications about its provenance, such as, for example, the liturgical use. I will not linger too long on this case, but one of the hits is the coat of arms of the modern town of Vatrelot, which, by the way, is not Waterloo, but a town in France at the Belgian border, near Mouscroum. Moucron. When you dive into that, you easily find that Vatrelot 
belonged since the 11th century to the Abbey of St. Baths in Ghent. So indeed, when you narrow down your queries on that information, you discover that these are indeed the arms of the Ghent Abbey. This will not surprise the liturgist because the antiphonary is made for the use of this abbey. By the way, googling d'azur au lion facé d'argent et de gueule would have led us quicker to Saint Bavon than the English version does. But what I just explained to you is not very precise, I do realize, but it is about trying things and see what comes out and uh, and checking things, like basically in all research. I have opened two other manuscripts, one of which we've seen already, um, because uh, Anna to 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 talked about it, in which in a lower margin and in an initial, we see twice the same coat of arms. We describe them thus, azure, because first the background, <coughs> across argent, because first the main charge, and then the accompanying charges additionally, always reasoning from left to right and up down, just like we read in a Western language. So across argent is followed by one and four, three merlets or small birds are always merlets or marlet martlets, two and three, a crab or. By the way, you see that English blazon puts the adjectives after the noun because it derives from French. In French, it goes like this, d'azur, à la croix d'argent, accompagné en un et quatre de trois merlettes d'or, et en deux et trois d'un crabe du même. The accompagné de is a bit more circumstantial than in English. In English, it's shorter. The du même is very common in French, and it is in order not to repeat things. So you don't say d'or twice, but you, the second time you say du, du même. But that's the kind of habit we also have in spoken language, in, in any language. Google searches did not help me further much in this case. But since we have a very rare heraldic object, the crab, it gives me the opportunity to show you Bibal, the database on provenance and book history for which I am myself responsible at the IRHT. A query crab, in the, fen the French word crab, of course, leads us directly to five manuscripts with the arms of Jan Krabbe, Abbot of the Dunen Abdei in West Flanders, and also to one other manuscript with a rebus about which you can read in Bibal if you do this query. As I said earlier, parted coats of arms, party, party per pale, armoire party, are not the arms of a married couple, but usually the arms of a married woman. As I told you before, all coats of arms really represent someone, person, personify someone. So this manuscript did not belong to a woman and her husband, but just to the woman. It is in fact quite like in our modern habit of the name of a married woman, which combines, or at least used to combine in many countries, the name of the father and the name of the husband. In a party coat of arms of a married woman, the dexter side shows the arms of the husband and the sinister side, the arms of the woman before she married, being most of the time the arms of her father. So here we have the arms of Mar Mary of Savoy, Marie de Savoie. On the dexter side, so that is the left, the arms of her husband, Philip Marie Visconti. These arms are quartered, which means built up in four parts from two different coats of arms, both shown twice, one in the first and the fourth part and one in the second and the third part. 
This is a rather common way of combining arms in the context of heritage and power over domains. On the sinister side, we have the arms of Savoy that are very simple. Gules across Argent. Beware, because sometimes party arms can be shown as if a side is half hidden, especially when the space is tiny. The example on the right is in the very, is in, so we, we here have two examples in the very same manuscript. In the one on the left, we see full arms on the, on the dexter side and full arms on the sinister side. But in the one on the right, it is a bit different because part of the arms on the dexter side are hidden. But from the size of the letters, we see that I've blown it up quite a bit and that it is very, the, 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 the initial is quite small. So that is the reason why this was a bit simplified. That happened here as well to the arms of Louise de Savoie on the lower left, where both sides are half hidden. As I said before, heraldry is a language with a grammar and a vocabulary, but also with historically grown exceptions and particularities. When we blazon this, these arms of Louise of Savoy, we get party per pale. So that means split in two. Dexter, azure, three fleur de lis or. Sorry, in Dexter, azure, three fleur de lis d'or, or. A label argent. In sinister, ghouls across argent. In French, one can blazon this as follows. Parti, au un d'azur à trois fleurs de lys d'or, au lambelle d'argent, au deux de gueule à une croix d'argent. So, one more specific new thing here is the label. So, we learn a label is the kind of, uh, um, how should I describe that thing we see uh, uh, at the upper part of the um, of the uh, left arms. In one case, we see them in white, and in one case in silver. But as I explained before, white and silver are regarded as exactly the same thing. It's only the different paint that was available. <laughs> Another example is this manuscript, where we do have in the lower margin the arms of a couple. Adolf of Cleves and Anne of Burgundy. His arms are the arms of Cleves. Her arms are the party arms of Cleves and Burgundy. But there's a subtlety here. We see the rather complicated Cleves arms on the dexter side. On your left. That's quite clear. We see Burgundy on the sinister side on your right as well, except that strips of gold have been added at the top and the bottom. And these are not for show. In fact, Anne of Burgundy was a bastard daughter of Duke Philip the Good, and therefore her arms are not the same as those of her father, but they have a cadency, une brisure in French. A cadency is an adaptation to distinguish arms of people belonging to the same family. The label we saw before was can be is a kind of cadency. And the quartering of arms in four parts can also be a cadency. But the addition uh, of something like the label can be as well. Here, the cadency is that the arms of Burgundy are shown on a fess. A fess is a horizontal zone on the background, and in this case, the background is golden. Therefore, we see the or, the gold, at the top and at the bottom. So, heraldry may seem complicated, and I do not deny that there are many things to learn, 
But I think that it is less complicated, at least I would, I'm trying to convince you of this, that it is less complicated than it seems. One of the main problems in Blazon, like in anything new you learn, is to distinguish what is significant and what is not. Many years ago, I leafed through a manuscript in Brussels with beautifully drawn illustrations and also with some rather funny, rather clumsily drawn red initials and drawings. Two big volumes with a lot of these kind of drawings and only at the very end of the second volume, one drawing looks like a coat of arms. The one you see on the lower right. And it was only then that I realized, well, not right away, it took me, it took me some time to get there, that in some others, the painter was probably also alluding to these arms you see on the lower right. When you describe these arms, using some help, of course, at the time, at, at the time I did not know how to blazon this at first either, in blazon you get berry nebulae, argent and gules. In French, blazon that is facé nebulae, d'argent et de gueule. One can specify that there are six pieces, very nebulae of six pieces, argent and gules, but that's not always um, uh, compulsory. So the two, the two, two possibilities. At the bottom, I have added another uh, coat of arms that is berry, argent and gules. So just to, to show you that berry means the horizontal divisions, and then berry nebulae means that these horizontal divisions are nebulae, nebulae, uh, a bit cloudy. <laughs> when I search this French blazon in Bibal, I get a lot of occurrences, and they all point to one family, Rochechouart. So I immediately get good leads and answers. But indeed, a general Google search also quickly leads to this family, even if there are some other hits as well. So blazoning a part of uh, 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 arms and then doing searches with the blazon is really very useful. I hope I have made clear that this that the sense of learning a bit of blazon, English blazon, French blazon, any other blazon, is to be able to carry out queries in Google or in specialized databases. So if I uh, one day want to search in uh, for uh, Spanish arms, I don't know Spanish, but in um, uh, blazoning arms in French and then looking up the translation in in Spanish, I can do searches with this this Spanish um, blazon and then see if that gives me leads. And of course, leads have to be checked, but that you know. We have seen that arms are often built up of several parts. This grew over time. In the beginning, arms were simple and straightforward, but through marriages and heritages, heritages not only dynasties, but also their arms got more complicated. Here you see the well-known coats of arms of the Dukes of Burgundy, Philip the Bold, John the Fearless, and Philip the Good, father, son, and grandson. They are built up of several parts. Because Philip the Bold was a younger son of the French king, his arms are built up of the Fleur de Lys, but also with the cadency, and the cadency is the uh, border we see around it, the silver gules border. But then he also became Duke of Burgundy, so his arms were his arms were quartered of the French, the, the part showing that he in the first and the fourth quarter 
the, the part showing that he was a French um, prince, and the second and the third quarter showing that he was Duke of Burgundy. Bourgogne Ancien. Because John the Fearless was, became also Count of Flanders through his mother, he added the Flemish lion in the middle, en coeur, en abîme. When Philip the Good became Duke of Brabant and of Limburg, he added these lions of these um, uh, the princedoms as well. All these tricks and leads, searches for parts of blazon, image-based queries, and even just browsing through printed images, or for example, in indexes of uh, edited armorials, or images on the web depend, of course, on your own knowledge and experiences, what you know about heraldry, but also about the context of the manuscript you have found them in, etc. When you want to identify arms in a manuscript, do not think you just have to open the right web page or book to find the solution there. Being an historical researcher means searching and browsing and querying around quite a lot. And, very important not to forget, ask help to others. As Michel Pastoureau always says, the first and foremost tool of any scholar is their flair. Just go ahead, follow your intuition, and do not give up too easily. And never forget either that medieval people loved to play and to jest. This is a, playing, a child playing with a handsome cube and a mill-like staff. I mean, it really is, but it is not only that. As other instances in the same manuscript show, we found both the more traditional coat of arms, forms, and many others, and also the keys of St. Peter and the tiara prominently displayed. So we learn that it represents the arms of the Pope, of Pope Clement VII, one of the anti-popes in Avignon. Thank you for your attention.